Amen. Amen. God bless you. Please be seated. I want to ask you a question. And when I ask you this question, there's, a, there's going to be a surface answer you could give, and then there's a deeper answer that you could give. It's a question that we don't like to think about. We spend time, in fact, ignoring the reality of the answers of this question. And, and the question is this. What are you the most afraid of? As you think about your life, what are you the most afraid of? Now, let's start simple. How many of you are afraid of snakes? Raise your hand real high. Like, you love Jesus. Yes. How many of you are afraid of spiders? Hands real high. Okay, 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 good. I have something I want to tell you spider people. This week, I read, I don't know if you know this, there is a new species of spider that has come to the United States. It came in 2014, it's in the state of Georgia, and it came from Japan. This spider, the Joro spider, I think we have a picture of it, the Joro spider. Now what's unique about this spider, it, it will grow to the size of a grown man's palm of his hand. And these spiders, when they spin their web, they do it in such a way, the thickness of it provides an ability for them, they parachute down out of trees. Isn't that awesome? You can be hanging out by the pool, walking down the sidewalk, anywhere you go, and they're invasive, like they can't be stopped. They came in 2014. They are now in 25 counties in Georgia. They've also moved into western South Carolina, western North Carolina, eastern Tennessee, and they say that over the next three years, they're going to fill the eastern states of the United States. <laughs> they, also say, they also say that they are venomous. The article said this, they are venomous if you're allergic to spider venom. I don't know if I am, and I, I don't want to know. And, and they say that there's nothing you can do. Now, I, there's something I'm going to do. Like, I own a shotgun. And so I'm going to take out as many as I can. And if y'all have shotguns, y'all take out as many as you can. We can make Central Florida safe, I'm pretty sure. But flying parachuting spiders the size of your hand. I'm not afraid of spiders, but I, I don't want any part of that. Like, I'm not about that. There's something about it, though, when it comes to fear. Snakes and spiders and sometimes... Sometimes it's deeper. Some of you, it's that haunting fear of aloneness. And you can be in a crowd and still feel lonely. For some of you, it's the fear of what you think might happen in your life. Because she's already said she's not sure she wants to stay. For some of you, it's the fear that you carry for one of your children. And you've done everything you can think of to help. And things don't seem to be getting better. Over the last couple of years, one of the things we know is that our fears have intensified. Fears have grown over the last couple of years. And part of that is because it's so hard to know so many times in life what to believe. Sometimes, sometimes we have so much information that it's too much information and we're not sure who to listen to or who to pay attention to. And, and sometimes, if we're not careful, we can, we can become afraid because of someone else's agenda. About a week ago or so, ESPN took a two-minute moment of silence in solidarity with transgender and homosexual people because of the Don't Say Gay bill in the state of Florida. Now, let me be clear. As followers of Jesus, the Bible says that we will be known by our love. And so we need to be very careful before we label and categorize people to understand that God deeply loves every single person you and I lock eyes with. But I'm also concerned as a father and a grandfather, and I feel a level of responsibility to at least inform you as, as your pastor. I've read the bill. It's seven pages. It doesn't say don't say gay anywhere in the bill. Like, what are we doing? It, it says that a teacher of children in kindergarten through third grade can't talk about sex. Heterosexual, homosexual, can't talk about sex. Like, 
I got to tell you as a parent, I'm cool with that. I'm okay with that. It doesn't say be mean to this group of people. It doesn't say ostracize a group of people. It doesn't say a group of people are less than. It doesn't say any of that. It says teach math. Teach reading. That's what it says. It's a parental rights bill. But see, what happens in our culture, and part of the reason I think fear has grown so much, is there's not only a lot of information, but there are a lot of people with a lot of agendas. Like, if you have to build your agenda based on a lie, I'm not sure I buy your agenda. It doesn't say that at all. But but we live in a world where so many things are coming at such a rapid rate. There's this feeling of there are things that I need to be afraid of. And, And listen... Make sure, make sure, like for example, what I just talked about, you can go online, you can read the bill yourself. Now, some of the bills, this thing, I'm not reading that. Seven pages, I can plow through. I can handle that. Like, you can read it for yourself. Don't just take my word for it. And the same thing is true as we dive into the scriptures. Did you know the Bible says that every single thing you hear from a pastor, you should go to the word of God and check out for yourself? Don't just take my word for it. You own your own spiritual condition. You own your own rights. You own your own life. Don't fall into a trap that can be lazy of just believing what you're told because you think you can trust a source. Don't do that. Believe the best, but verify the truth. But fear. I ran into a couple of and I did not long ago. We were walking in our neighborhood. And I saw them out in the driveway. We started talking and... and Like two years ago, they were here all the time. And then, you know, the world changed and everybody like became afraid. I I don't know what y'all did early on when everything changed. And they said, oh my gosh, there's COVID-19 and it can kill you. And, and, And it did have some devastating impacts in a lot of areas. But I remember early on, remember 15 days to flatten the curve, 15 days, 15 days turned into two years, 15 days, we're going to flatten the curve. But what happened was Amazon packages coming to our house. We had, we had canisters of baby wipes by the front door, and I was wiping down cardboard, and I was washing my hand. My hands looked like the hands of an 85-year-old man early on because so much information, we had no idea what to believe. And if we're not careful in culture and society, we can grow and become afraid. And this couple, this is what they said to me in the driveway. Pastor, we, we're going to come back to church. We're, we're just not ready. Now, here's what I thought but did not say. I saw you in Cooper's Hawk two nights ago. Like you were, <laughs> maybe you didn't see me, but I saw you were throwing down some food. I like, like you, you, Cooper's Hawk, okay, church where God shows up. No, it's probably not safe. I, I, I get it. Makes complete sense to me. But, but if we're not careful, we let fear grip us and dictate, and fear can also become an excuse to miss the life we know we could live. Fear never led anyone into the will of God. Fear never led anyone into the purpose of God. Fear has never led anyone into a blessed life. Fear has never led anyone to achieve their dreams. Fear does not create great people. Fear does not create great spouses, great parents, or great friends. And in the word of God, God has never blessed fear, but he always blesses faith. We're moving into Romans chapter 4 today. If you're a guest this morning or it's your first time, we're walking verse by verse through the book of Romans, and here's why. Romans has been called the masterpiece of theology by theologians. Romans Romans does an outstanding job inspired by God. Now listen, this is not going to surprise you. I believe the Bible is the Word of God. I don't believe it has any mixture of error. I think it's all the word of God. I think it's useful for us in our day-to-day lives. It is foundational to our faith. That's what I believe. If you don't believe that, we can still be friends. Like, you're welcome here. But I do believe that, and that probably doesn't surprise you. And so Romans is a book that tells us who we are, does a great job of telling us who we are, who God is, and what we should do about that. See, I think it's important To not only know what you believe, but know why you believe it. And in Romans, God addresses this issue of fear through the Apostle Paul. This week, I was looking up some uh, world records. I I I like to read a few of those every now and then to see what the crazy people are doing. And I noticed noticed a few records, sometimes not crazy, sometimes just, just different. The loudest snore ever recorded. The loudest snore ever recorded. Kare Walkert, a Swedish gentleman, 
They recorded his snore at 93 decibels. Now, you might be like, okay, what, what does that mean? That would be like sleeping next to a gasoline-powered lawnmower running all night long. So he's probably single, but they recorded his snore at 93 decibels. This was one. The, chil- the most children born to one mother, not at one time, but in the childbearing years, the most children born to one mother, this lady holds the world record. I cannot say her last name. I'll butcher it. She's, she's from Russia. She had, in her lifetime, gave birth to 69 children. I thought the same thing. Like, our motto is four and no more. Like, we're good, but 69, 69. Like, you have got to lose your mind. Good night. She had 16 pairs of twins, seven sets of triplets, four sets of quadruplets, other kids, 69 children from the same dad. I think his theme song was Honey Got Booty Like Pow, Pow, Pow. He, he, he like, he was all about his wife, 69 kids. Sorry. <laughs> I'm going to pay for that one. 60, I mean, but see, it, it just kind of locks up my brain, 69 children. I, I have four, and I'm, I'm full. I'm good. Like, I, I, I can barely make it. This one, the oldest mother, let's move along. The oldest mother to ever give birth was Carmela Busada in Spain. She gave birth to twin boys, December 29, 2006. She was 66 years old. <laughs> no, Jesus, no. Mm-mm. Now, that's a modern world record. But there was in history a woman who had a baby boy at 90 years old, Abraham and Sarah. And Paul, the Apostle Paul, the Holy Spirit of God through Paul, is going to introduce us to Abraham, who's been called the father of our faith. Now, what you need to know about Abraham, 60% of the people on the globe today say that Abraham is the father of their faith. There are three different religions that claim that, not all rightly so, but that claim that what they believe in their faith came from Abraham, the Jews, the Christians, the Muslims. That, that somehow Abraham, I'm sorry, Islam, somehow Abraham was the father of their faith. And he's an example of how to live by faith. Romans chapter 4, verse 1. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? If, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, all the good things he did in his life was justified, made right with God, he had something to boast about, but not before God, because you can't be as good. I can't be as good as God. Now, Abraham, like Paul, had a name change. Paul, early in life, was Saul, and God changed his name to Paul. Abraham, early in life, was Abram. Abram did not meet God until he was 75 years old. He lived the way he wanted to live. He lived as what Scripture would call a pagan, had his own ways, did what he wanted to do. And at 75, he meets God. Now, the name Abram literally means high and exalted father. But at 75, when Abram meets God, he still doesn't have any kids. Abram, his name means high, exalted father. Are there any of you that you you don't like your name? Girl, my, my, name, my name is Byron, and anywhere I go for making reservations or if I'm ordering a coffee and they ask for my name, I say it, then I spell it, because people, when I say Byron, they're kind of like, what was that? And here's how I spell my name every single time, B-Y-R-O-N, because if I don't pause after the Y and make sure they got the Y as the second letter, they're going to write Brian, B-R-Y. And I'm called Brian most of the time, but Byron. So I grew up, man, I couldn't stand my name. Even when my dad said, son, there was a Lord Byron. Well, I'm not him, and I'm not into poetry, so I don't care. I don't like the name Byron. I would have given anything to change my name, but Abram, his name means high and exalted father. Think about it. He's married to Sarah. He's in his 20s and 30s, and in a business transaction, he meets somebody. What's your name? Abram. Oh, Abram, how many kids do you have? None. We're working on it. We're working. I promise. Then he moves into his 40s and 50s, and people begin to talk about it less. His family knew not to bring it up. How could someone be named High Father who has no kids? In his 60s and 70s, can you imagine the cringe that he felt when people would say his name, Abram, High Father, and kind of look at him in a confused way? So you can imagine when God shows up, he's 75 years old, he has an encounter with God, and God says, Abram, I'm going to change your name. 
That had to be an incredible moment. Maybe he even tossed up to God a few ideas. Maybe, hey, you can name me this, name me that. And God says, no longer will your name be Great Father. I'm going to change your name to Father of Many Nations. For real? I'm 75 and I have no kids. But what seemed unreal had never been more real. It was unseen because it was unrealized and that's because it was unfinished. What seemed impossible and improbable, God would do, and it would change all of history. At 75, Abraham meets God, and God speaks to Abraham, and Abraham obeys. The Bible says that faith comes by hearing the word of God. And when you hear God's word and believe what God says and do what God says, you'll see what God does. Faith is is God telling us to trust him that he'll do what he promised to do. Now think with me. God shows up, Abraham's 75 years old. He doesn't know much about God. He doesn't have a Bible. He doesn't know anybody that believes in God. He has a small amount of knowledge, but what God tells him to do, he does. Abraham has a small amount of knowledge, but a huge amount of faith. Could it be that you and I know more than Abraham, but believe less than Abraham? We have more knowledge. We have the Word of God. We're able to dig in and research and try to see, okay, God, what do you say about this? And what do you say about life? What do you say about suffering? What do you say about depression? What do you say about caring for your family? God, what do you say about all? God, what, what, what do you say about forgiving? And how do I lean into that so that it doesn't, the, the poison of bitterness doesn't ruin and change me? God, what do you say about anger? And what do you say about my temper? We're, we're able to dig in the Word of God with all that. Abraham had none of that. We have more knowledge but less trust. Abraham has less knowledge, but more trust. And it's not what we know, but how we live and how we trust in light of what God says. Some people, often I hear people say, man, I'm dealing with some things in life. I just wish, I wish God would speak to me. I wish God would show me. He probably already has. The issue may be you just need to believe and obey what God's already said. You you don't need more information from him. You need more faith in him and obedience to him. Could that be true in your life? Sometimes as followers of Jesus, if we're not careful, we we chase what we call deep. And we say, man, I just want to go deeper in my faith. I just want to go deeper in my relationship with God. And I understand where that comes from. But I, I think the deepest thing we can do is love people God loves that we have a hard time loving. It may not be that I need to learn something new. It may need to be that I need to practice what I already know but don't like. And God says to Abraham, at 75 years old, start over. I want you to start your life over. I want you to to leave everything you've known, the land you've earned, the land you've gained, the crops that you've grown, the livestock you have, your friends, I want you to move. I want you to start over at 75. Some of you, you know what it is to start over. You know what it is to to try to restart your life at a point where you look back and there have been some failures and there have been some things you regretted or maybe some things unexpectedly happened to you and you know what it is to have to start over. But this is a guy who built some wealth. This is a guy who had some stuff and God says, I want you to leave it all and start over. And Abraham not knowing as much as we know about God, obeys. Hey, God, where where are we going? You'll see. God, what's the plan? You'll see. Just trust me. At 75, he resets his life. You know what that means? As you and I get older, just because you're old doesn't mean you're done. As you get older, listen, one day you'll retire from your job. Don't make the mistake of retiring from your faith. You can continue to make a difference no matter how old you are. My dad is almost 80 years old. My mom passed away in December, and my dad had been her primary caregiver for seven years as she battled Alzheimer's. And the last few years, she she knew nothing. And day and night, seven days a week, every day of the year, he cared for her. When she passed away, I... I talked to him all the time on the phone. We went out there for a while. and He seemed sort of lost. Everything he'd known, 
everything done. He, he'd been with her for almost 62 years, dating and then marriage. Like, life is different than he's known it in decades. And it, it took him a minute. But you know what he did? He went and he talked to his pastor. He goes to uh, what I would call a, a much more traditional kind of old school church. And there are a lot of senior adults in the church. And there are, a lot of, there are a lot of older people that simply can't go to church. Physically, they have some issues going on. They, they can't go out. They can't get there. So my dad said, I want the list of all the senior adults in the church. And now he calls them, goes and visits them. And when he goes and visits them, he sets it up. If they want the deacons to come and serve them communion in their home since they can't go to church, they do that. They've started that now. He has started an entire ministry that wasn't even there before because at almost 80 years old, he decided, I may be retired from a lot of things in life, but I'm not retired from my faith. You never get too old to make a difference. At 75 years old, Abraham restarts his life. Now, Abraham is also called friend of God. Have you ever thought about that? Would you want to be called friend of God? I, I don't want to be called his enemy. And I read why he did that whole Sodom and Gomorrah. Thing. I, I want to be friend. We're good. Me and God. Abraham's called friend of God. See, our pursuit should be that we have a faith in God so we can be friends with God. But it's all about the relationship. When the Bible speaks of people walking with God, like Abraham did, you hear that phrase sometimes, that so-and-so walks with God, and it paints a picture that they're, they're close to God, they're in relationship with God, they have faith in that relationship. When our kids were little, in fact, one of my favorite pictures is a picture of me and our oldest daughter, Kaylee, when she was a little bitty girl, she was maybe two, we were walking through a park, we lived in Missouri at the time, and she was holding my hand. She was holding my hand, because of the relationship, because I'm dad. And with all of my kids, when I would hold their hand, you remember when your kids were little, if you have kids, you'd hold their hand. You know what you do? You walk at their pace, not yours. And I would walk at her pace, and she held my hand, and she, <laughs> she had no idea where we were going. She just knew that I did. She had no idea what was going to happen when we got there. She just knew that I did. So she held my hand and I would walk at her pace, but she trusted me to get us where we needed to go, when we needed to be there, and what needed to take place would take place. You and I have a father, a heavenly perfect father, that is not afraid to walk at your pace, to walk at my pace. And he invites us, hey, life's going to be hard. There are going to be a lot of things that bombard you. There are going to be seasons that you have more fear than others. There are going to be times that you have more questions than answers. That's called life. And there's going to be a whole lot to be afraid of if you focus on that. But if you'll just focus on me and hold my hand, we'll go slow. I'll walk at your pace, but I'll get you where you need to be. And then we move into verse 3. And in verse 3, the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul quotes Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. In fact, Genesis 15, 6 is quoted in several places in the New Testament. Notice verse 3. What does Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Credited. Credited. Notice that word. What does that word mean? Credited to him as righteousness. Now, to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. Credited to him as righteousness. Abraham said, God, I, I believe you are who you say you are. I'm going to do what you want me to do. I believe you'll do what you say you'll do. And knowing his age and his wife's age and how impossible it was, God said, hey, you're going to have a son. You're going to be the father of many nations. Abraham believed God. See, faith is not pretending that things aren't bad. Have you ever known somebody that was so caught up in what I would call their religion or their beliefs they seem to be kind of delusional in their thinking. Those people, I just have faith, bless God, I just have faith. It's not going to be okay, I just, I just have faith. Have you ever known? Some people are so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. Some people just live in this kind of fairy tale. Faith, real faith is not a fairy tale. Real faith is not pretending things aren't bad. Faith is knowing how good and how powerful our God is, even in the middle of bad things. Faith is God, I trust your promises over my reality. And listen, Reality can scream louder, and sometimes faith just barely whispers. But faith is far more powerful than my reality, and I can trust it. Verse 5, however, to the one who does not work but trusts God, who justifies the ungodly, that phrase, justifies the ungodly, 
Justifies is a transactional term. It means to be made right with God. He justifies the ungodly. Who are the ungodly? You and me. He's covered that. Remember chapters 1, 2, first part of chapter 3, rough stuff. God who justifies the ungodly. Their faith is credited. There's that, there's that word again. Their faith is credited as righteousness. See, faith is an internal conviction that leads to an external action. Faith is when what I believe in here, I live out there. Faith starts in me, but it doesn't stay in me. I meet people sometimes that say, oh, I, just, I have faith, but it's just a private faith. No, no, no. Faith is never private, real faith. It is deeply personal, but it is never private. There's always an outward action that, becomes of authentic, that comes from authentic faith that we believe inside. My, my faith that Angie and I would spend our lives together. I, I met her when she, I, I was 15 years old. 15 years old. And my faith that we should spend our lives together did not just remain as a belief inside me. They call those stalkers. My faith resulted in a marriage and kids and a life together. There is outward evidence of what I believe inside. Now notice the next verse. David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the one to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against him. See, Paul is shattering this, this religious thought, the idea that there's anything that I could ever do to earn God's favor or righteousness. See, if I could work for salvation, God would owe me something. If I could be good enough and do enough, if I could build a resume impressive enough, and, and when I died and stood before God and somebody said, hey, why should we let you into heaven? Because you owe me. I did all that stuff. There won't be one single person that's able to pull that off. Salvation is a free gift from God. It's not something that you can earn. So what does God see when he sees you? How you think about how God sees you right now. Is it based on what you've done? Or is it based on what he's done? See, it's what he's done. Faith is based on grace, and grace is about believing and receiving, not working and earning. And when you think of the things that, that you need to change and do and fix to be right with God, you're basing it on you. What if you went online to your bank account this afternoon, and you noticed in your checking account, you had a credit, it wasn't there yesterday, you noticed you had a credit for $2 million in your bank account. Let, let's just dream a little. I mean, the first thing you do is tithe, of course, of course, but, but you know, hey, I didn't earn that. Where did that come from? I didn't work for that. I didn't, I didn't earn that. Notice verse five again. Their faith is credited. Notice how many times that word credited comes up in this passage. Their faith is credited as righteousness. Credited is an accounting term. It means literally that in the ledger or the record of your sins and mine, when we place our faith in Christ, what he credits through his grace is always more than enough to cover any sin you would ever commit. This means that when I come to Jesus and I place my faith and trust in Jesus, I'm not just forgiven. It doesn't mean my sin is just erased. It's so much more than that. It means that on my account, there has been a credit of righteousness. Jesus took from his account righteousness and credited it to my account and placed it in my name. And so it's not that God just sees me as not guilty. It's that he sees me as whole and righteous because of the credit Jesus gave me from his account. And you can charge as much as you want to your account and you cannot outspend the righteousness credited by Jesus because of him to your account. It's all taken care of. Verse 9, in this blessedness, it is this blessedness only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? Is this, is this blessing, is it just for the, the Jewish people or is it for the Gentiles too? Is it, is it just for a select group or is it for everybody? We've been saying that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. Under what circumstances was it credited? Was it after he was circumcised? After he got right with God, after he did what God wanted him to do, after he obeyed God, or before? It was not after, but before. 
And he received circumcision as a sign, a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So then he is the father of all who believe but have not been circumcised in order that the righteousness might be credited to them. And he is then also the father of the circumcised who not only are circumcised, a lot, lot, lot of circumcision happening today, a lot of circumcision, but also who follow in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. What, what does all that mean? It means that that credit that was taken from Jesus' account and put into our account, that transaction took place before I did anything. It's not based on me, it's based on God. Before I obeyed the first time, before I did anything, that credit was made available to me. Is this, is this blessing, is this salvation only for some people? No, he's saying it's for every single person because every single person needs authentic faith. No matter who you are, th this applies to you because this faith is your only hope. And the more faith we have, listen, the less fear controls us. The more faith we have, the more time we spend with the Father, spending time with Him, holding His hand, walking at our pace, learning about life, the more time we spend with Him, the more our faith grows. And the more that happens, we recognize how small some of our fears are and how big our God is. And those fears are small because compared to our God, He's huge. We have a God who loves us exactly like we are. In this text before circumcision in our lives before obedience, but he loves us too much to let us stay the way we are. That's where faith springs into action. That's why faith isn't private. That's why faith doesn't just stay on the inside. That's why there's some outward evidence. James, the brother of Jesus, said, without works, your faith is dead. So what, what happens on the inside, now it sounds contradictory, but it's not. Paul is saying faith is something that takes place on the inside that works its way to the outside. James is saying it's not real faith unless there's an evidence of it in your life and you're acting based on what you say you believe. God will meet us exactly where we are, but through the process of faith and growing in my relationship with Him, I don't stay there. Angie and I have always deeply loved all of our kids. We consider ourselves the most blessed parents on earth, and I hope you feel that way too if you're a parent with your kids. We love our kids, and part of that love is, as a parent, you love your kids in their worst moments also. Like when they're little, and they explode in the diaper. And I, I, I don't know how you can poop in a diaper, and it gets up on the back of your neck. Like I, I ha How does it squirt out? Like, like I, I don't understand exactly that process. We had above average kids. They were they were able to do a lot of stuff with that. But I, I loved them. Or, or our, our, uh, Nate and Ethan, when they were little, they, they thought mucus was also hair gel. And I, ugh, you don't want to mess with that. You, you love your kids even in their worst moments. But as a parent, I don't want them to stay that way. My kids are grown. I don't want them to wear diapers. And none of them use snot for hair, hair gel anymore. Like, we've passed that stage. I loved them when they were in that stage but I helped them navigate and get out of, and they grew, and they, they did what they learned, and because they put to action what they were learning, they grew out of that stage. Verse 13, it was not through the law, he's talking about the scriptures, it was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. It wasn't that he kept all the laws, the over 600 laws in the Old Testament that they were expected to keep. It wasn't that he did all that perfectly. He couldn't. It was the righteousness that comes through faith. For if those who depend on the law are heirs, faith means nothing and the promise is worthless because the law brings wrath. And where there is no law, there is no transgression. What's he saying? He's saying the law reveals what convic convicts us. As I read the Word of God, it's actually reading me. And I'll come across things in Scripture that are convicting, that I recognize in my life, in my thoughts, in my actions, in my words, in my processing, in my attitudes, in my motives. There are things that are not consistent with what God teaches. And those are areas that I need to bring in line with and bring in obedience to what the Word of God teaches. The law reveals what convicts us, where we've sinned, which means it reveals our need for Jesus. See, placing our faith in Jesus is what makes us right with God. But how do I do that? It's, it's transactional. The Bible says that you and I will all, we'll, we'll stand before God in judgment one day. And one of the scariest parts of Scripture 
is where the Bible says that God will say to some people, depart from me, I never knew you. And there will be people that say, but, but God, I, I pastored a church. But God, I, I, I gave a lot in the offering. But God, I, I helped people. But God, I, I was kind to people that were mean. Depart from me, I never knew you. I think part of the reason that's going to happen is because some people believe there's a kind of faith that we have that can only happen in here, but it never has to be revealed out here. Faith, authentic faith is transactional and coming to God and beginning that personal relationship, it's something that God initiates and God begins in our heart where we know, hey, I, I need Jesus in my life. I need the forgiveness of sin. I, I, I need more than that. I need, I need the righteousness of Jesus credited to my life because I'm broken and messed up. Welcome to life we all are. And some people, man, you know that's what you need, but you believe all the right things, but nothing's really changed because placing your faith in Jesus is transactional. If I walked into this room and said, hey, I wonder, I wonder. In fact, I remember the first day I walked in this room a few months ago, having no idea what God was going to do. But if I walked in this room and said, I wonder if that platform will hold me up. Listen, I could bring in all the research scientists in the world, people that study carpet and fiber and metal and steel and wood and fabric, and, and they, could, they could study this, and they could present me with a written report, a thick report using a lot of big words, and, and they could say, hey, we've done the research, we have all the facts, it's going to hold you. And I could even hold that report in my hand and say, hey, I believe the report. All the experts say it's going to hold me, but I would never know until I actually stepped up on it and transferred my trust from believing all the right stuff to saying, Jesus, I give you my life. I put my life in your hands. Could it be that you've had a kind of a faith, believing some right things, holding the book in your hand, I believe it, but you've never experienced the transaction of putting your trust in Jesus by giving him your life. And could it be that God wants to do something today where he extends his hand to you, wanting you to be his child, saying, hey, let's have a relationship. Follow me. I'll, I'll walk at your pace. But I'll take you where you want to go. And I'll help you live in a way that you trust me and fear will never control you again. Would you pray with me this morning? Heads bowed, eyes closed. I wonder if today is your day. See, I, I don't believe you're here by accident because God knew what I was going to talk about. He knew that you'd be here. And today I wonder through what we've talked about if, if God is saying to you, hey, you need to take that step of faith. You need to transfer your trust from yourself and all that you're trying to do to do better and to be good and to figure things out. And just invite me to come into your life and forgive your sin and allow me to credit from my account to your account. Forgiveness and righteousness. With heads bowed and eyes closed, if that's a step of faith you'd like to take, I'd love to lead you in a very simple prayer. You don't have to pray it out loud. You can pray it in the quietness of your heart. But if you'd like to give your life to Jesus today and invite him to be your personal Lord and Savior, just pray this prayer. Dear God, I know that I need you. Jesus, please come into my life. Forgive my sin and help me to live for you. As best I know how, I commit my life to you. In Jesus' name.